a natural keeping rhythm and beat so like that. So thank you so much for that, Miss Ethel. Um, Miss Heather, just putting the songs together with Riley, I know she did an awesome job of doing that, and then you working with her, practicing with her to get that together. Miss Kathy coming in an extra day to work with the students and be with them and all of that. Uh, Hunter, Kyle, man, the students loved y'all's games. I mean, you guys rocked it with the games, and I'm sorry if anything got really messy, because I know my clothes were ruined yesterday. Um, but you guys did a fantastic job doing that. And anything else we asked y'all, y'all y'all stepped in and did it. Caitlin, man, Caitlin, we, we just simply asked you to kind of help with music. But you just stepped in in places that we didn't ask you to do. You just said, here, I'm just going to help. And it was just awesome how you just encouraged the students this weekend. Thank you so much. And then, I, I got to say Jennifer. Uh, I can't forget Jennifer. She was absolutely a huge part going through meetings with the students that were planning this, going from the schedule, organizing so many different things, designing the shirts, just so many facets where she was helping. Just give a big round of applause to them for this weekend. It was <laughs> to, to think about where we were last year in the year 2020. These doors were closed. We were all in our homes watching services that Brother Cole was doing from either his living room or his office. And if I was doing it, I was doing it in one of these buildings in this church. We were watching it over video. And to think back the past couple of months, what we've had experience as a church, the Easter egg hunt, and now Hot Hearts, to see Things are not being canceled or postponed anymore. We are actually pushing through with a church schedule where we can build relationships in person and have a moment where we can say we can worship Jesus in a way that we can be in person, growing and discipling and being able to encourage each other with our words, not text messages, not Zoom calls. But we can give handshakes. We can see people with the encouragement on their face and the love of Jesus in their heart. Isn't that something awesome to say in the year 2021 so far? That's a big thing to be thankful for. And this weekend was just a big picture of that, how we had so many wild events, so many memories made this weekend, all because of just the grace of God. And I'm so grateful for the students. I'm so grateful for the leaders. I feel like we made so many memories. I know it would not be like it would be when we would go to Hot Hearts in Bowman, where we're surrounded by, you know, thousands of strangers and concert and speakers. But you know what? I think we did a fabulous job with this weekend. The memories we made, the lessons we learned. With that, guys, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in James chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be going through verses 14. Through 26. And uh, this morning, as you're turning there, I'm going to pray for us in just a minute. But I'll give you a little background on James before we get there. Um, the author of James is James, um, is uh, Jesus' half brother. Um, and it's kind of cool how James actually opens this book in chapter 1. He, he calls himself a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could easily title himself, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. I got, you know, some authority, some leverage that way. But James comes in a humble way saying, I am a servant of the Lord, which wasn't always the case. James, when Jesus was alive doing his ministry, James didn't quite understand what he was doing. He, he knew he was teaching. He knew he was doing these great, wonderful works. But he just still saw him as his older brother. In fact, there is a, an instance in the Gospels where the family of Jesus comes to him and says, Hey, we need to talk to you about what's going on. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, This is my brother. And then he tells his disciples, his brothers there, In comparison to the love you have for your father, uh, you must be able to have a comparison to love. You love me. You have to love me in a way that you seem like you hate your mother, your father, your brothers and sisters. He's not saying that you should hate them, but in comparison to the love you have for Jesus. How he is that primary source. And James didn't get that at first. 
He didn't understand that until after Jesus resurrects from the grave and displays himself as the Messiah, as the Savior. Then James realizes who Christ is, and that's his older brother. And when he gets to his book, James, he declares, I am his servant. He is my Lord. And he's writing this to the Jewish Christians of the first century. So this is, this is written to uh, Jewish Christians in and around the town or city of Jerusalem. Because James is actually a leader in the early church of Jerusalem. Um, and he's telling them this consistent theme of being doers of the word, not hearers only. He actually states that in James 1, of being doers of God's word, not hearers only. And in that kind of, that's kind of something we kind of talked about this week, this weekend. And the, one of the stories they used this weekend was how a uh, man and a woman go through the courting process. They get engaged. They make all these, these plans for the wedding. They make all these commitments and stuff like that to get ready for the wedding. And then they have this beautiful wedding. You know, everything goes right. The, the unity candles go over well. The, the prayers go over great. The songs are just eloquent. The preacher does an awesome job of presenting, so it's like Brother Cole up there preaching for him. And it was just all this great things going on at the wedding feast. But then it comes to the point where we look at that couple and they say, you know, if being hearers only is like going to the wedding and then the bride and groom leave in different vehicles and they go to different homes. We know that's not the way it works. We know in our minds, like, that's not the way I remember my wedding going or anyone else's wedding going or anything like that. I remember that it was about the promise you had at the wedding that continues to make that marriage. Those covenants you make continues to have that marriage go. So when we compare that to being hearers of the word and doers of the word, being hearers of the word is like being at that marriage at the beginning of that wedding day, and you just split off. You say, you know what, God, I, I felt you at this particular event. I, I, I felt you moving in my heart at that revival. I felt you moving in my heart at that camp. I felt you moving in my heart at that conference. But then I'm going to split from you. When I get back home, when I get back to the workplace, I'm going to split from you. I'm going to go to my home, you're going to go to your home. And that would be the difference between a doer of the word. Because what James tells us to be doers of God's words, not just hearers only. He doesn't want us just to be sitting in a pew. He wants us also to be doers of the word. He wants us to be able to take what we have learned from Jesus and then apply it to act out on it. To keep that covenant, that promise that we made with Jesus. We don't simply just say the prayer and then the next thing you know we get baptized and then we stop being a Christian. We continue to go and be faithful to Jesus, pursuing Him, obeying His commandments, and doing what Jesus did, which was love people. So, um, with that, we are in James chapter 2. Uh, let me pray over this passage real quick, and then we'll, we'll dive into this message here. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning. <coughs> We, we humble ourselves this morning before your word. We humble yourselves before and worship this morning. God, I am so thankful and grateful for the hands that are part of leading worship this morning. I pray over this message, God. I pray over every heart that's in this room, Father, every, every person that will see this message later. But God, I, I pray that they would sincerely dive into your word right now. God, that we would see the truths of your word. We would see how the Holy Spirit is guiding us this morning. Father, I pray that God, that we don't leave this message in this room today. That God, we take this message and we take it to our homes. We take it to our workplaces. We take it to our schools. And we take it to our neighbors. Father, I pray that God, that you put upon us a, a calling in our lives today, Father, to act upon your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Alright guys, so uh, the passage we have read earlier today was Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And that passage basically says, 
that we are saved by grace. There's, there's no action you can take. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation, which is very true. We are saved through the grace of Jesus Christ. And James falls right along with that in this particular passage of chapter 2. But he comes at it from the after standpoint. So James, again, he doesn't contradict with Paul with Ephesians. Because sometimes we think we get that mixed up. Because we hear Paul say, oh, again, you're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. And James is hammering on faith. He's hammering on uh, this afterwork of your salvation. This afterwork when you experience grace. And so today... We're going to be looking at it, and I just want to pause for a moment and ask a question. Um, who in here is currently employed, like currently in the middle of a career? Not retired. Okay. Uh, Mr. James, what is it that you, you do for work? I'm an electrician. Electrician? Okay. So what, what does electrician do? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to do these guys as well. Run away for the ladies and run wires for electrical current. Okay. So when you retire, when you, when you cease to have that as a career, when you cease to have that, be doing those typical things? Oh, okay. <laughs> Most of us would hope so, yeah. It's kind of interesting when we think about our jobs and our careers and stuff like that. We, we have this title, right? And out of that title, there are certain things that we, we do because of that title. When you're an electrician, you, you lay out the wires, you, um, you, know, you hook up outlets, you hook up breakers and all these different things. Me as a pastor, I do lessons. That's kind of what I do. I just do all kinds of messages and I study and I pray and I, and I go around visiting. And, and when I'm retired, I'm probably... Might still do some of those things, but a lot of those things I probably won't do as much. And it's kind of interesting to think about that when you when you have this career, you have your faith in your career, you trust your career title. So because you have that faith in that career title, because you have that trust in that career title, you're going to do actions with that title. It wasn't that you were doing those actions before you got that title, because I'm sure before you were an electrician, you weren't just laying random wires. Unless you're just that kind of person. Um, but, I mean, kind of think about that. It's like your career, you, you got trained in doing that. So you develop a faith over your title, over your career. And because of that faith, because you were saying, hey, I believe this, actions came out of that faith. When you are a pastor, you, you develop these messages and you start preaching these messages. When I'm not a pastor, I... I don't know, probably won't be doing that, but here's the kicker of this. When we look at ourselves as Christians, when we have this faith in Christ, what are the actions we're taking to display that faith in Christ? As we were, say, hey, a electrician, or a logger, or a welder, or a counselor. Because that's, that's ultimately your ultimate identity. So many times I, I think we get uh, this, this idea caught up in the fact that when we when we make a living, that becomes some of our identity. It becomes our, our title in such a way. And we can see what we do with that title, what, what actions we're willing to take with that. But sometimes I think we, we kind of can say, hey, we can kind of get lost in our careers being our, our main identity. When truthfully, for Christians, you to call upon Christ as your Lord and Savior, your ultimate identity is Christ. Your ultimate identity is Christian. And from that, that's where faith and actions meet. So let's, let's dive into the Word. Because that's exactly what James goes over in chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And let's, let's get into this here. Uh, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, 
And I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Because even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also a faith apart from works is dead. Let's... Let's break this down verse by verse. We, we start out here in verse 14. It, it, it tells us, what good is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith, it does not have words, can that faith save him? James lays out this, this question with a rhetorical negative type of answer of what this looks like. And he's just coming out there and saying, hey, if someone has faith without works, does, does there, is there really faith in there? Are they really call it upon for faith. It's like saying to me, or I'm saying to you, if I were to say to this pew, I trust to sit on you. I believe that you will hold me up. Okay, so I, I declare that, I, I say that, I have knowledge that this bench should support me. And actually, it looks kind of comfy. I could probably take a nap on it, actually, if I, I really wanted to. Uh, but I have not displayed any evidence of my faith right when Mr. James displays faith that he's an electrician, he displays evidence in his faith. He's laying out wires. He's hooking up lights. He's hooking up outlets and stuff like that. That's evidence of his faith in his career. So my faith in this bench doesn't really have any evidence until I finally sit down and feel actually, oh, this is nice and comfy. I might just sit here for the rest of the service. Uh, this here is the evidence of my faith in this bench. Showing that it is important. In doing this, James jumps right into the next verse in verse 15. And he says, A brother or sister is poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. So he, he draws this picture for the reader of someone that's saying, Hey, there's this, this poor person here that doesn't have food or clothes. And he basically lays out there saying, Hey, if that person came to you and says, I need food, I need clothing, and you just say, bye, be filled, you know, get, get some drinks somewhere else, stuff like that, you know, good luck is basically what James tells us in the next verse there. Without giving them what they need, what, what good is that encounter? What good is that word you're telling them? And I'll, I'll give you kind of more of a Christian look at what that might actually look like. We'll have someone come up to us and say, hey, I need you to pray for me. I have this going on in my family, or I have, have this struggle in my life right now. And you're like, you know what, I'll, all right, that's good. I'll pray for you. You have a good day. Uh, I'll go, I'll go on, I'm going to try to remember to pray for you. And you know the worst part of it is you actually forget to pray for them when you sit down and pray. Instead of taking the opportunity right there and stop from your busy day and pray for that pray over that person. Two things happen there. One, you make a connection where they see you care. And then you also plant a seed of the gospel of Jesus in that person during that prayer. That is a very powerful moment to take. And that's just a small example. And I, I think so many times we, we come into our church today and you say, you know what, I... Dustin, I, I have that faith. I, I have that desire to want to help people. I want people to come into church today, and I want them to hear worship. I want them to be in the service today. But the, the, the thing is, guys, there's a big portion of our community that will not step in our church today because they will not feel welcome in our church. And it's probably because they won't feel welcome because they say, you know what? I don't look like you. I don't 
talk like you, I don't think like you. How, how are you going to make me feel welcome now? And if you're expecting lost people to act to save, and you're expecting to invite someone from the community that you know is dealing with just brokenness and sin and addictions and pain and immorality, you're expecting them to say, hey, come to church with me on Sunday morning and have them plop on a pew and everything's going to be all grand. They're going to uh, somehow get it. More than likely not. You might have someone that, that will come. But more than likely, they're going to be so embarrassed by what they have going on in their lives that they won't feel comfortable being. So what do we do? How do we help I, I give, I love our church. I love how we, we're so willing to help with food. Our food pantry is an awesome ministry. It is, it is by far one of our best ministries we have going on every week. Where we have people coming up here and we, we help them in such a way. And if people come up to our doorstep, we, we are always helpful in trying to give them a ride or give them gas money or uh, give them whatever they need. If we don't have it, we, we are so good on trying to give them the help that they need. But then there are situations that I feel like that is not just our church, it's just churches everywhere in general struggle with it. They struggle with the people that don't look like us. There's the people that are just swamped in their brokenness. They're swamped either with alcohol, with drugs, if it's with sexual morality, if it's with something else that's addicting, because believe me, I, I know when we hear the word addictions, we automatically go to drugs and alcohol. That's not the only thing that's addicting, believe it or not. There's things that are so more addicting today than those things. If you want to really see something that's addicting, go to the school and see how many kids are on their cell phones. See how many kids are all, have a tablet with them. See how many kids are close in front of a TV screen. And it's not just students that are like that, it's also adults too. How many times do you find a man saying, hey, i got to watch a football game or a race or a basketball game instead of coming to church or something like that? So screens are just as badly as addictive as any other substance. In fact, anything that can be an addiction away from God, it's anything that can pull you away from Jesus can be an addiction. Going fishing can be an addiction. Going golfing can be an addiction. Anything. That you say, hey, you know what, I, I'm going to choose this over and over again without any rationale. That's an addiction. Especially when you say, I'm going to choose that over Jesus every time. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think we all have had something we've been addicted to. We all have had something in our lives to say, hey, I'm going to choose this over Jesus right now. Because guess what, we're all sinners. Jesus said himself, no man is good except for the Father. That includes everyone in here. We, we will say, hey, that's a good man, that's a good person. And honestly, when Jesus holds him to his hand, it's like, no, you're not there. Not, not even Brother Cole, not even Brother Dustin. You guys aren't good. But catch us, the difference is we're going to get to this in a moment, is that if you're that Christian, the thing that separates you from a lost person is you're willing to of your sins. The willing to repent of your brokenness and come back to Jesus. And that's what these people really need. These people that are saying, hey, I can't step in there. I need someone to show me the mercy and grace of Jesus. Which means we have to build these relationships. We have to be where they are. We have to go into their homes. We have to go to these people and lay it out there for them that, hey, we love you just as you but we're not going to let you stay where you are. Because that's not what Jesus does. When you look in the Gospels, you see these accounts of how Jesus encounters people. We look at Zacchaeus. We look at Matthew, these two tax collectors, also known as the biggest traders in the town. He comes to him and says, hey, follow me. He comes to Matthew and says that. And Matthew drops everything he comes. It comes to Zacchaeus. He goes to Zacchaeus. Hey, Zacchaeus, I know you're the most hated person in town because everyone sees you as the traitor. In fact, you have to have a Roman guard to take you from your home to your workplace because you're worried about being attacked. You're worried about being spit on. You're worried about being just made fun of. 
I'm going to stay in your house, Zacchaeus. I'm going to be your guest. And Zacchaeus is blown away. He's like, this Jesus, this great teacher, this guy who's doing miracles, this guy who's doing wonders, is wanting me to host him in my home? I haven't hosted anybody of my nation of Israel. I haven't hosted any Jewish people because they don't want to be seen with me. But this great teacher wants to come to my house? Man, I feel so loved and accepted in that moment. And these people that are struggling with these hurts, these hang-ups, these people that are these lowly brothers and sisters that need us to be there for them. Not to simply say, here, there's a pat on the back, good luck. They need us to get there with them, to take care of their needs. To help them meet the needs they have. And Jesus is there to do it. The question is, is we have to find a way to bridge where we are as Christians to these people with Jesus. Verse 17 says, So also faith by itself, it does not have words, is dead. Now I think this comes back to what we were talking about earlier with that bride and that groom when they go to the wedding and they go to separate places. You know what that really ends up being? It ends up being saying, hey, I have all this knowledge about Jesus. I have all this knowledge about God. But when I have all this knowledge, I have zero application. If we are in that arena where we've come to church and we sit in the same spot in our pew, it's like, hey, this is, this is my spot, by the way. I'm, I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to hear another great message from Brother Cole or any other pastor that steps up here. Uh, we're going to have a great time of worship and everything like that. And, and then I'm going to go home and I'm just going to get ready for the next Sunday. What we've done is we have fed ourselves with information. And we haven't shared that information. This faith that's dead is when we, we all we do, our highest Christian point, our highest spiritual points is sitting in these pews. When our highest spiritual point is at those conferences and those camps and those retreats, those revivals, our highest spiritual moment is when we accepted Christ, if our highest spiritual moment is when we were dumped in the waters and baptized, then our faith is dead. Because a faith that's living is a faith that's active. And the difference with that is when we come to these pews and we get all this information, we get all this knowledge, we don't leave it here. We take it home. We take it to work. We take it to the classroom. We take it to the school. And if you want to look into the community, we take it to our neighbors. And I know a lot of us are like, you know what? I, I love my home. I, I love being secure in my home. Uh, I leave my neighbors be. I let them do their thing. But when we look back at what Jesus did with Zacchaeus, Look back what Jesus did with maybe even the woman at the well. He loved them no matter what. He came to them as they were, but he did not leave them as they were. He loved them too much to leave them the way they were. He loved them too much for them to be a constant traitor of their people. He loved them too much for the woman at the well who was this woman that had five husbands and the man she was staying with was not even her husband. She was known for that, and she was ashamed of that. And Jesus loved her and told her all about that and says, you know what, you can't be different if you choose. And she leaves different. She goes back into the town that she was so ashamed of walking around and sparks a revival in her community of Samaria. Oh yeah, by the way, Samaria, a place where Jesus would have hated. Most times Jews went around that community, but Jesus walks in there and says, you know what, I'm going there to talk with this woman because she needs me to show her grace. We've all needed that. Your neighbor needs that. Do you love them enough to go and share that? I know we have this idea of saying, I love Jesus, and I love him enough to bring the gospel to people just as they are. But then we got to get to the point that says, hey, I love that person enough to not leave them in the middle of their brokenness. 
And that is the faith that is leaving, is living. When we say we're not going to leave you in your brokenness, we're going to love you through your brokenness. We want to help you get to this point that you can get to be to where you're like Christ. Verse 19, it says, You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. We, we talked about how when we, we come into this building and stuff like that, we collect all this knowledge. Don't we realize that demons believe in God? They know there's a God. They have all this knowledge about God. The difference between the person who acts on this faith, this person that will... Um, have this living faith, this person says, you know what, I'm still going to declare Jesus to this person. I'm going to go and tell. And that's the Great Commission. The Great Commission tells us to go, to get out of our comfort zone, to get out of our houses, get out of our homes, get out of our rooms, and go to our neighbors, telling them about Jesus, making disciples. And it's interesting how you look at that whole Great Commission. If you look at Matthew 28, the order that he puts those actions in, the first one is to go, to get out of your comfort zone. The next one is to make disciples. Okay? Not, not teach them 15 Sunday school lessons. Not have them in church for five years. But go ahead and tell them about the love and grace of Jesus and have them be made disciples. And the next action in the list there is baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. And from there, when they, they experience that baptism, this, this unbelievable thing to think about, when they dive into the waters, they, they experience the death of their sin that Jesus took upon the cross, and they're resurrected through the power of Jesus and His resurrection. They are now a new creation. They are made new. When we have these people that are lost, they are not going to be lost anymore once they're found. They are a new creation. They are a new person. They have grace upon them. They have the Holy Spirit upon them. Uh, a, a, a visual we had this weekend was we, in the Old Testament, we had this idea about God is with us. And He's still with us. God is with us all the time. We can't get away from God. No matter how much we try to hide from Him, He's always there. When we get to the New Testament era, we get to where Christ comes onto the scene. We have this great innate ability to have Christ in us. It's not only God with us. It is Christ in you, living in you, guiding you, starting eternal life right here, right now, today. Verse 21, or verse 20 through uh, 25, gives this illustration where it says, Do you want me to show you a foolish person that their faith apart from works is useless? And then James brings in this illustration of Abraham. And it's interesting he brings in Abraham because we, we all think of Abraham as his father of faith. And we, we see the example of Isaac. And that was Abraham's like his big moment of faith. Because if you look before that, he has several instances where he's not very faithful. Uh, he actually deceives uh, Pharaoh. He actually lies to another person to kind of save his own skin about his wife and uh, their relationship. Um, but when it gets to Isaac, it's, it's his moment that he's learned to say, you know what, I, I just need to commit and be faithful to God. And that moment of where he says, all right, God, you tell me to sacrifice my son. I'm going to go on this three-day journey. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to be faithful during the entire time. I'm going to sacrifice my son Isaac. And God says, you know what? Stop. I don't know what um, You are, I'm going to count you as faithful because you're willing to do this for me. And that is by his actions that Father Abraham was declared faithful, that he was declared to have this heart and relationship with God. And then we have this next example of Rahab, where Rahab sends the two spies that comes to her house. This prostitute, by the way, saves these spies and sends them out another way, and she's claimed faithful by the actions she took. She had this sinful lifestyle that she bore, but she is called faithful because of this action of where she displayed a heart for God and acted upon that heart for God and turned to help spies to get out and be able to come to the promised land. 
And then you get to verse 26. If you have your Bibles, this, if you want to look at a particular verse, I know I've talked a lot. You can ask my students. I do this way too much. Um, I, I just can keep going on and on and on. I guess that's just a common trait of Baptist preachers. Uh, but if you want to look at a verse to hang on to for this message, it is verse 26. And James here does an interesting thing where he ties in an analogy of the spirit and the body with faith and works. So many times we look at our world today, we look at the physical body. We, we, we are in a Western society that believes, hey, if I can see it, I can touch it, then it's real. And that's our body. A lot of people don't really think about the spirit being attached to that. We look at how our society works today, what people kind of envision, what people kind of think, and it falls in line with that. You, you think that's maybe not the case? Well, look at how government is going upon setting laws right now. Look at what is on social media right now. Look at what's plastered over regular news media right now. When we look at immorality that's just going on in our communities today, we look at saying, hey, um, sexual immorality is going rampant in so many different directions. And they're basically saying, hey, you can have this bodily pleasure. The spirit, don't, don't worry about that. You, you don't have to worry about the spirit so much. You can, you can shack up. The, spirits, the spirit doesn't matter. But you can have that physical pleasure all you want in so many different aspects and different ways. It doesn't matter about the spirit. There's no big deal there. When it comes to uh, the drugs and the alcohol, they say, hey, your, your physical body can use this ease of pain or this, this sense of having a heightened state here. Or when you get to a point like, hey, if you just play this game here, if you just distract yourself enough physically, your, your mind can check out. You don't have to worry about your problems anymore. You can be on social media for hours and, and see the best in people. And you can see like all the junk that you have. You can kind of separate your body from the spirit in those moments. Or you can be on video games for hours on end, controlling the scenario, controlling how things work, because you can realize in your life you don't have control. And it's all an idea of taking the body and separating the spirit. But the truth is, if you do that, you might as well have your body dead, because you're killing your spirit. We're seeing people coming up so much today that their bodies are just seeming so numb. And you think, you're saying, Dustin, that doesn't make any sense of what you're saying. When we look at the world today, we want to look at numbers. We want to really see what we see numbers making evidence of people saying body is separate from spirit. Look at how the suicide rate is climbing. Look at how the depression rate has skyrocketed. Look at how divorce rate is still climbing, even though there's so many people out there saying, hey, we don't even want to get married. And it's all because this adage in our Western culture today is saying you can take the body and separate the spirit. But scripture tells us you can't do that. Because what you're doing at that point is you're already putting two and a half steps into eternal death with your body and spirit. And the scripture is telling us that we need to have this living faith. And here comes where James ties in this faith and actions together. How he relays it from the body and the spirit. He compares it to where if you have faith without actions, it's just like taking the body and taking the spirit away from it. So if you have faith, you say you have faith, but you have no evidence of that faith. You're setting yourself up to the point of saying, hey, I'm really questioning my salvation at this point. Because I have no fruit that shows you my evidence of my faith. I'm not doing any actions. I'm not really studying the Bible. I'm not really praying anymore. I'm not really worshiping anymore. I'm not really testifying anymore. I'm not sharing Jesus anymore. And what you get is you say you have faith, but what you really have is just a declaration of your faith, and it is empty. It is dead. We have so many people in our culture today. We have so many people in our country today. We can look back at the 2020 census. We had two-thirds of our country proclaiming to be Christian. 
scary point, when we look at churches today, is not two-thirds of the country in churches. It is far, far less. We have so many people out there that have this commitment to say, this knowledge to say, I know who Jesus is, I know who God is. But I don't have any actions to back it up. That is the clear definition of faith being. And I know some of you guys in this room are thinking of people in your lives right now, you say, no, I know they say they're Christian. I know they say that they believe in Jesus, they know about Jesus, they know about God. But they never talk about Him. They never pray to Him. They never study His Word. They never tell anybody about their testimony. They never go on missions. They never even go to church. That is a classic example of someone who says they have faith in their faith. Can someone tell me what this is? Orange, thank you. Yeah, it's an orange. Do y'all do y'all think oh I think that was on there now. Uh, do y'all think which tree this orange came from? What kind of tree? Orange tree? Why? Why do you think it comes from orange tree? You have to try to show it again. Don't, don't be scared. Because it's an orange. It's crazy. I may just go to the mic in a second. It's crazy to think about when we proclaim to be Christ Christians. But where's the fruit of our Christianity? You know, I was a, I was a student pastor in New Orleans. And uh, one of the deacons there had this huge citrus tree. Like tree after tree after tree after tree. And he would actually tell us, hey, come over here and pick some, because if not, the fruit's just going to be bad. Uh, the trees are not going to produce very good the following year, so just come pick some fruit. So there were times I walk out with like five sacks, maybe six sacks, I don't know. It was, it was a lot. I probably had 200-something pounds in citrus thrown in my car, and I'm like, what am I going to do with 200 pounds of citrus? <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm throwing it into you. Dorm rooms, I'm throwing it at my parents' house, I'm throwing it into apartments, just giving away citrus, having it at uh, youth uh, meetings and stuff like that. So they had oranges and sasumas and gosh knows what else I can throw out there for months on end. But the deacon that owned that citrus farm could point to every single tree and tell me exactly what fruit he had in that tree. He knew the fruit of that tree. He knew what kind of tree it was because of the fruit that it was born. And the truth of this here is that by the fruit, you would know the root. You would know that someone is a Christian by the fruit they bear. You would know someone's faith is alive by the fruit that they bear. You would know that the roots are well alive when you see the fruit growing on that tree. So today, as we close this morning, I know we've kind of gone all over the place. I just want to open the floor today for an invitation. Uh, we're about to have one last song come up here. And um, I believe it's just as I am. Uh, or no, it's Jesus paid it off. Yeah, Jesus paid it off. Uh, I want you guys, where you are, to think about what we kind of talked about today. I want to ask yourself, hey, is your faith alive? Or is it dead? Now I want you to think about yourself. I want to think about that person you know saying, hey, I'm pretty sure their faith is not where it should be. I'm pretty sure their faith doesn't have any living fruit coming off of it. And I want to challenge you guys. I want to open up this front area, if you can make it up here, I want you to pray for that individual. If you know someone, say, hey, I, I need you to just lift up those prayers for that person. I know their faith is dead. I want you to come up here and pray for that person. I want you to think about how can I, as a Christian, as someone that's called to go to them and to love my neighbor, how can I find a way to share Jesus with them, to have them be able to make living fruit out of their tree for them?
If you can't make it up here today, I want you to just be right where you are. I want you to pray right where you are today. And think about those people to reach out to. Think about those people to say, hey, how can I get their faith to be living? I want you also to pray for our community. Because we're still filling the rampants of 2020. And even before 2020, if there's still things that are big problems in our community. And if we are looking for revival and spurger, it starts with prayer. If we're looking for revival and spurger, it starts with us recognizing that we need to show people how to bear fruit. So let's pray this morning, and then we'll go into our invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this morning, Father. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for James, Father. Father, I pray today, God, God, as we have seen these students come up here and lead worship, Father, their, their faith on display, may that be a, just a shining example of encouragement to us all, God, to say, hey, that they're stepping up, they're leading, they're, they're getting up here, they're, they're committing to worship. What can I do? What can I do in our church to, to help the glory of God, to help the gospel of Jesus to be made known in Spurger, Texas? I pray for everyone's faith here this morning, God. I pray to God that it is alive, that God, that there is fruit coming from our faith, God. That God, that we're not just simply saying that I'm a Christian and declaring that I'm a Christian. God, I can declare so many different things. I can say anything, but if it's not backed up by evidence, if it's not backed up by works, if it's not backed up with fruit, then I'm saying empty words. I'm saying dead words of dead language. Father, I pray that none of our faith in here today is dead. If it is, God, I pray that we can reconcile this morning. If there's someone this morning that needs to, to understand the salvation and the grace that comes in Jesus, I pray that they will come to the front. I pray they will talk to either me or Brother Cole or, or uh, any of the deacons this morning, Father. God, I, I pray that, God, that they will begin to understand this grace that comes through your Son, Jesus, where we have eternal life through Him, Father. Father, I, I pray, God, that anyone that needs to make a... a Confession this morning, God, you would do that, God. I pray for anyone that says, you know, I just need to pray for my neighbor. I need to pray for my family, my friends. Like, God, they would have the boldness and courage to say, I'm going to do that this morning. And I'm going to put into action a love plan action to reach that person. Father, we love you. We praise you this morning, God. May this message of our faith be alive not stay in these walls today, but may it go out into our community. These things I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.